I'm sure if you've been to Jerusalem, you've stood in front of the Western Wall. Now, when you stood in front of the Western Wall, you most likely were overcome by feelings of inspiration. It was an awesome feeling. The wall is steep with thousands of years of Jewish history. But tonight, I'm going to share with you secrets behind the Western Wall. And I think that by the end of this presentation, you will have a newfound appreciation for the Western Wall and for the Temple Mount, as we are going to look at the Temple Mount in a way that you have never seen it before. So the way it's going to work is I'm going to share my screen. Uh, we're gonna, it's going to be a PowerPoint-based presentation. There'll be images, some, uh, short video clips, and um, we will begin right now as I share my screen with you. So here we are. The title of tonight's presentation is Underground Secrets of the Temple Mount. All right, so let's do the lecture outline of the presentation. First, we are going to begin with the expansion of the Temple Mount from the period of King Solomon until the temple, the second temple was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 of the Common Era. And then we're gonna look at the mind boggling construction methods that were used, which are absolutely staggering. Following that, we're going to look at the mighty retaining walls that surround the Temple Mount. And we will conclude with a thrilling virtual tour of the Temple Mount as if we were a pilgrim visiting the Temple Mount 2,000 years ago. Now, essentially what we're gonna be doing is when you visit the Temple Mount today, when you visit the Western Wall today, when you look at the perimeter of a Temple Mount, there is more than meets the eye. We are going to point out various clues that have been hidden over the centuries and have been exposed in more recent times. And we're going to piece together like a puzzle until we reconstruct virtually the beautiful, magnificent edifice that once stood upon the Temple Mount. And, and we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna close it off with that uh, virtual tour, which is a uh, visual simulation. So let's begin uh, what this lecture is not. The lecture is not a study on the temple and its vessels, being that this is this presentation is strictly from the, through the lens of archaeology, and there are no archaeological remains of the actual temple itself. It's also not a collection of homilies on the importance of the temple from Jewish sources. That's something that your rabbis can teach you, especially during this period of time. You will walk away with an appreciation for the archaeological remains of a Temple Mount, a glimpse of the glory of the past based on current excavations, and the yearning for the rebuilding of a Temple and restoration of Israel's glory. So let's begin here with this map of Israel. And as you can see, Jerusalem is right in the center of Israel. Here in this inset, we see the city of Jerusalem. And in this inset, looking to the right, we can see the old city of Jerusalem divided into four quarters, Jewish quarter, Armenian, Christian, and Muslim. And here on the eastern side of the old city is the enormous Temple Mount platform, which will, will be the focus of our presentation tonight. So we begin with the expansion of the Temple Mount from King Solomon until King Herod. And the reason why we're doing this is to give us an appreciation of the Temple Mount, we have to look at the progression of how the Temple Mount expanded. So we're gonna begin with the following question. And that is, what happened to the Mount of the Temple Mount? So as you're looking at this image right here, uh, this is an aerial view of uh, the Temple Mount looking from the east. You'll see the, the main feature on the Temple Mount is this uh, uh, Dome of the Rock top with this golden uh, dome, which technically is not a mosque, it's a shrine. Here on the southern side is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, topped with the Silver Dome. And there is the Western Wall Prayer Plaza. When you look at this 
platform, this plaza, this temple mount, it doesn't seem to look like a mountain. It looks like a large plateau. Why is it called Temple Mount? Well, in order to appreciate uh, the answer to that question, we have to strip away and go underground and take a look at the expansion of the Temple Mount throughout the various phases. So we begin with King Solomon's Temple Mount. And here's in the bird's eye view, you can see, uh, here's the dotted outline of the current dimensions of a Temple Mount. And this color-coded yellow square is, was the extent of King Solomon's first temple mount. And it's, as a matter of fact, it was the same size also when it, the second temple was, was built by Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel, and those who returned from the Babylonian exile. So as you can see in this topographical map, the original mountain, which was known as Mount Moriah, is slowly being covered up by the Temple Mount uh, Plaza, which was constructed first by King Solomon and later by those who returned from the Babylonian exile when they built the second temple. Now the, the Hasmoneans, who were otherwise known as uh, the Maccabees from the Hanukkah miracle, Hanukkah story fame, the Hasmoneans, uh, they, there was a Hasmonean dynasty that lasted for about a hundred years towards the end of the second temple period. The Hasmoneans were great builders as well. So there was a point in time when they felt there was a need to expand the Temple Mount because of the large influx of pilgrims who would visit the Temple Mount. So they extended the Temple Mount southward, here color-coded in orange. And as we look here at the side view, we'll also notice that they introduced a new element and that's this bridge. Now, why did they introduce this bridge? The reason being is because many, during uh, the time period of the, towards the end of the second temple period, there were many Kohanim, many priests who lived in what was known then as the upper city, which is this area right here, which is roughly the Jewish quarter of the old city today. And if you've been to the old city, you'll notice that the city is on a hill, uh, the Jewish quarter is on a hill. And as you make your way towards the Kotel, you got to go downstairs into the valley. So, because there were many Kohanim that lived here, there was a concern that if the Kohanim, who were the ones that performed the temple service on the Temple Mount, if they were to enter the Temple Mount using the main entrance in the southern wall, which was known as the Hulda Gates, there was, they would mingle with the masses. And there was a concern that they may come in contact with someone who was impure and they would contract impurity, thereby rendering them unfit to, to serve in the temple uh, the, for the temple service. So in order to circumvent this issue, the Hasmoneans built this bridge, which would serve as a shortcut where you have a direct access from the upper city right on to the Temple Mount. Now the Herodian Temple Mount built, expanded by King Herod was by far the largest expansion. As we can see here, color coded in green, Herod extended the Temple Mount south to the west and to the north. He did not extend it on the eastern side. And as you see here, his expansion was by far the most ambitious project of all. And as a matter of fact, from here until the end of our presentation tonight, we will focus on the Herodian expansion of the Temple Mount. And reason being is because when the Romans destroyed the temple, the second temple in the year 70 of the Common Era, this was the, remain, the existing Temple Mount that they have destroyed. And what remains today is the Herodian remains of the Temple Mount. So let's talk a little bit about Herod. Now, Herod was known as Herod the Great. Why was he called Herod the Great? Was it because he was a great guy? Absolutely not. He was a terrible guy. He was a tyrant. He was an, a ruthless dictator, hated by the masses. He killed out his, he even killed his own wife, who was the last surviving scheme of the Hasmonean dynasty. He killed out all of the rabbinic sages, except for one who he blinded. So why was he called Herod the Great? The reason is because Herod was one of the greatest builders of all time. He had left his construction mark all over Israel and beyond. Some of you may have visited a site called Masada, very popular site in Israel. Masada was discovered, first discovered by Herod, uh, where if you visit Masada, you can see that he built this fortress palace on top of that 
imposing plateau. So as you can see, Herod's project, uh, which is color coded here in, in his expansion, color coded in brown, was surrounded by these massive retaining walls. And these walls enclosed an area approximately the size of 24 football fields, which is approximately 37 acres in size. This was the largest plaza in its day, larger than any plaza anywhere in the world, including Greece and Rome. And the question is, why is it called retaining walls? What exactly did it retain? So in order to understand, the answer, to appreciate the answer to that question, we're gonna to have to take a look at the, how the Temple Mount expansion was constructed. Uh, and for that, we're gonna move on now to explaining first what type of stones Herod used. And these are typical Herodian masonry of the Western Wall. This is a slice of the Western Wall when you visit the Prayer Plaza. And as you can see, uh, the characteristic Herodian stone consisted of a smooth front face with a margin around the sides. And uh, the center was slightly raised, which is called the boss. And this is easily distinguishable as Herodian stone. Now, you may notice that some of these stones here are not exactly smooth, and that's because they have been weathered over time, coming in contact with the elements, the rain, and so on and so forth. Now we're going to take a look at the construction methods that were used by Herod's builders to build the mighty retaining wall surrounding the Temple Mount. And the question that has boggled the minds of archaeologists, of scholars, of engineers, even in modern times, is how were the huge ashlars lifted? The ashlars are a term for the large stones. And uh, I want to take another poll now, if, if I may. Uh, can you give me a thumbs up? Who here has been to the Kotel Tunnel Tours? Give me a thumbs up. Kotel Tunnel Tours in Jerusalem. Okay, see, some of you have been to the Kotel Tunnel Tours. It's definitely worth um, exploring. Very interesting uh, tunnel that goes to the, the entire extent underground along the um, western wall. I'm going to show you now this photo here, which is your first thing, the first thing you see, one of the first things you see as you enter the Kotel Tunnel Tours, and that is this enormous stone within the western wall. Now this one stone from one end to the other, which I don't mind be sure if it fits into the picture, is 45 feet in length, 11 and a half feet in height, and estimated to be about 15 feet in depth. Scholars, engineers have estimated that this one stone weighs in at about 570 tons. That is absolutely staggering. Now, granted, this stone was found in what's known as a master course, which is closer to the foundations of the wall, uh, which consisted of larger stones on average uh, for added stability. But nevertheless, there are many other stones in the Temple Mount uh, walls, especially in the Western Wall, and uh, especially as you move to the corners of the wall, where the builders place larger stones for added stability, where you can find stones weighing an easy 50 tons or more. And the question is, how were these builders able to lift these stones weighing many tons to the great heights of the structure of the building, of this wall? Just for comparison's sake, the pyramids in Egypt, typical stones in the Egyptian pyramids weigh anywhere from three to five tons. And the typical stones in the Western Wall are many, many tons. Uh, like I mentioned, 50 tons uh, or 10, 20 tons and more. And, and this, is the, this is, has been really uh, bothering modern day engineers. And they are just baffled as to how these builders were able to lift these huge stones.